Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode. In the first two CHP episodes, we've looked at topics concerning ancient China. If you're someone pushing 60 or mo, today's topic took place in your lifetime. This time we're looking at one of the more painful and disastrous moments in modern Chinese history. The Great Leap Forward, or Da Yue Qin, as it's called in Mandarin, was a catastrophic case of central planning gone awry. As I'll show you in this episode, this was all Chairman Mao, using the full extent of his prestige, his power, and political forcefulness to single-handedly wrestle control away from the more conservative central planners who had led the economy since the country was founded ten years earlier. You see, Mao had this idea that if you were able to harness the energy of the massive Chinese peasant population and mobilize them with a single-minded purpose, you couldn't help but rapidly speed up economic progress. This mega-disaster came as a direct result of Mao's policies, aided and abetted by a thousand sycophants who shined Mao's shoes and went along with the program, not daring to speak the truth. And why should they? They learned a lesson in survival when, in 1957, Mao had encouraged party members to speak up and even criticize the party. Believing Mao's sincerity, a lot of party members got some stuff off their chests and aired some grievances. <laughs> but the grievances contained a lot more criticism than Mao had counted on. And some of it was even directed at his leadership. Therefore, in response to this, he launched the anti rightus campaign, and half a million people who answered the chairman's call to speak up ended up getting purged and had their lives ruined or extinguished. The lesson all party members learned from this hundred flowers and anti rightus campaigns was keep your mouth shut. So beginning in 1958, when Mao came up with this idea for a great leap forward, Party leaders and cadres knew better this time, and no one dared to tell the emperor that he had no clothes. That was a big part of the problem. This was all Mao's idea, and as a result of this policy, or campaign, or whatever you want to call it, as many as 36 million people, mostly Chinese peasants in the rural areas, starved to death or killed. The Great Leap Forward was China's second five-year plan, from 1958 to 1962. China today, in the year 2017, is in the midst of the 13th five-year plan. Now, I'm planning to discuss the topic of 1950s Sino-Soviet relations in another podcast episode. Suffice to say, for your understanding in this episode, when Mao and the Communists took control of China in October 1949, they faced a rather hostile West, who had supported his enemy, Chiang Kai-shek. Mao aligned China with the Soviets, and they served as the model for China's economy and socialist development, and pretty much everything else, including the uh, architecture, sorry to say. The USSR, first Stalin, then Khrushchev, played the role in these earliest years of the PRC as China's communist big brother. And the two nations managed to get along for about eight years. And after Khrushchev's secret speech of February 1956, Mao's distrust of the Soviet leadership fell off the end of the table. And then, not long after a train wreck of a meeting between Khrushchev and Mao in November 1957 to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution... The shoe-pounding premier unilaterally broke ties with China and pulled out the 15,000 Soviet experts who had been overseeing 150 different development projects in China. They bolted, taking the blueprints with them. Mao understandably didn't like this, and he felt very vulnerable being so dependent on his Russian comrades to the north. So Mao Zedong was quite determined to overtake the primitive Russian economic management model by adapting it to Chinese-style socialism and then turbocharging it with China's massive peasant population. And then, in theory, all these combined policies 
would allow China to overtake the Soviets and then raise the country up to a level comparable to the West. He believed he can do it. And in the process, Mao Zedong was going to school Nikita Khrushchev. So Mao was able to silence his opponents in the 1957 anti-rightist campaign, sufficient enough to begin the step-by-step -step organization of the peasantry into people's communes, Renmin Gongshe. These communes were to serve as the bridge that would take China from socialism to communism. The economy was methodically decentralized. That is, more decision-making authority went from the party center to the provinces, cities, and towns. The idea was to take the political shackles off local cadres who knew better than these modern-day Mandarin bureaucrats up in Beijing about how best to grow their local economy. Central planning was shunted aside, and what was best for each locale was determined by local authorities. It sounds good, but it wasn't. There had to be some leadership coming from the center to keep the management of the economy organized. 1958 was when it all started. Mao spent the first four months of that fateful year doing what emperors would do from time to time over the past thousand years or so of Chinese history. He took a grand tour of the realm. The purpose was to get a first-hand look at these agricultural cooperatives and communes and see how they worked in practice, both economically and politically. The idea was that, from this nationwide inspection tour of early 1958, the Communist Party leaders could gather enough facts on the ground to properly launch the Great Leap Forward. The January 1958 New Year's Day front-page editorial of the People's Daily, the mouthpiece of the party, announced the goal of surpassing Britain economically in 15 years and the United States in 20 to 30 years. And the yardstick that was going to be utilized to determine the measure of their achievement was going to be the production of grain and steel. The basic thinking amongst China's leaders, and especially with Mao, was that there was no way to increase industrialization of the economy unless agriculture was addressed first. Industrialization and heavy industry were Mao's primary objectives. It was going to be through the achievements in industry that Mao was going to show the Soviets who was better. But before that could happen, he knew he had to deal with agriculture first, and that meant dealing with the peasants. Now, all the peasants had been working hard on their own little private plots handed to them after land reform in the late 40s and early 50s. As happy as the peasants were with having their own land, this method of production was way too inefficient and prehistoric. Mao said the countryside had to be transformed into large-scale collectives that employed more modern mechanized farming. Starting in the mid-1950s, this transformation began to take place in the countryside. On January 6, 1958, Mao went to Nanning, down south in Guangxi province. And it was in Nanning where Mao's idea was discussed and everyone nodded their heads with approval when Mao called for a three-year period of all-out mass mobilization and effort. And then in another meeting in Chengdu in March, Mao called for the same thing. All-out mass mobilization. Rejection of the Soviet model. When party leaders didn't show complete agreement with their chairman, they got called out and fell back in the line. So Mao continued his grand tour and held meetings in various locations. In late January, early February, Mao unveiled the 60 articles that were to serve as a sort of handbook on how to navigate this Great Leap Forward, as it was named for the first time in Article 16. Article 13 summed up Mao's thinking and how he looked at everything. I quote, The next ten years will be determined by the next three years. Efforts should be made to bring about basic transformation of the look of most areas in the next three years. For other areas, a longer time may be called for. The slogan is to fight a hard battle in the next three years. The method is to rouse fully the masses and to test everything. End quote. In Articles 21 and 22, Mao elaborated on the whole matter so dear to his heart about uninterrupted revolution and that it was 
better to be read than expert. And it didn't matter how brilliant you were. What mattered was your loyalty to the party and how well you walked the party line. The articles also discussed how all these unrealistic production targets were to be put in place to put pressure on everyone. It all started at the top in Beijing and was sent down all the way to the Xian, or county level. Now, also contained in the 60 articles was the announcement that Mao was stepping down as chairman of the state. Now, he retained the post of party chairman, but the head of state position was passed to a great Chinese leader and statesman called Liu Shaoqi, and he ultimately would end up dead on a cold prison floor in November 1968 after becoming Chairman Mao's primary target when he launched his other disaster, his sequel to The Great Leap Forward called The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. And you could listen to the CHP eight-part series on that topic in episodes 83 to 90. You see, Mao's total control of everything was manifested by his ability to prevail over his colleagues, to subdue them, and to manipulate them against their better judgment and to enthusiastic followers of his vision. So as I was saying, Mao was in the midst of this grand tour of the country, early 1958, taking his luxury train all over the place and checking out these communes. Now, he didn't just show up unannounced. The President of the United States can show up with the Secret Service in tow, unannounced somewhere and film an impromptu photo op moment mixing with the common folk. But in China, especially with Mao Zedong, if Mao was coming to a village near you, everyone knew about it way in advance. So when Mao's train would show up at these places, these towns were transformed into utopian Potemkin villages, carefully set up by local cadres. So Mao went from town to town, city to city, taking in one revolutionary paradise after another. And this was Mao's special way of simply going over the head of the state and party apparatus, using his magical prestige directly with the grassroots. Who cared what Beijing said? As long as Chairman Mao said it, it was gospel. The revolutionary zeal of all these local and provincial officials was such that in 1958, after quite a decent year of weather, the most exaggerated claims were made about how great everything was going with agricultural yields. And these local cadres were encouraged by the provincial officials, who were in turn encouraged by the officials from Beijing, to deliver false data regarding agricultural production. Hearing such good news, central planners in 1958 said they were targeting 525 million tons of grain. The year before, the output had been only about 195 million tons. To give you an idea about that 525 million ton number, China's grain output last year, in 2016, was about 616 million tons. And China today is a far cry from what it was 60 years ago. So the whole system was an utter and complete shambolic to the maximum, from the top down and back up to the top. Mao would show up on his train and the whole moment would be staged from the communal dining halls overflowing with food to the crops that, well, if you believe the stories, would be moved and replanted closer to the train station so that when Mao pulled into town, he could see with his own eyes how abundant the harvest was going to be. And when these local officials would get their moment with Mao, they just pulled out their shoeshine box and spilled their guts to the chairman about how great his policies were and how fabulous everything was there and how it would be absolutely no problem, Skip, to meet or exceed targets handed down from the party center. Each stop at each commune, Mao was able to see not only how well things were going with agriculture, he was able to see how fabulous things were going with local steel production. Now, more on that in a moment. Those around Mao knew the truth, but not a single one dared to speak up. Mao's secretary, Tian Jiaying, said of this unbridled sycophancy, quote, When the king of Chu was looking for a consort with a pretty figure, all his concubines starved to death trying to lose weight, end quote. This is pretty much what was happening in the zeal that so many exhibited to tell Mao what he wanted to hear. 
They embraced Mao's plans as crazy as they may have thought them to be because you know, they feared for their own lives and political futures if they showed anything less than the most extraordinary enthusiasm for whatever the pronouncement was that he gave. And those who survived the 1957 anti rightist campaign were most anxious to avoid becoming a casualty of what was shaping up to be Mao's next big thing. And then from the top down, from Beijing, down to the provinces, the cities and the townships, down to the individual commune, everybody made sure that everyone was in on the scam and everyone had everyone's back covered. And no way was Chairman Mao going to be anything except pleased with what he saw, read, or heard. Even the topmost layer of leadership and the most practical of leaders, Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, Chen Yun, Chen Yi, despite their best judgment, all fell in line behind Mao and the Great Leap. Mao was so good at controlling absolute power in China. He did it in three ways. He controlled the army. He controlled the party ideology. And he was the big spider at the center of the web of intrigue. That was the Politburo and the Central Committee. This made him invincible. You see, Mao naively thought that steel production was the measuring stick for how well industrial growth was coming along. So every commune was encouraged, or actually forced, to set up what became known as backyard steel furnaces. Peasants who knew nothing about producing steel, put their farming chores on hold and engaged in this activity. There were about 600,000 of these furnaces dotted all over China. The output from their efforts was useless and couldn't be used and shouldn't have even been counted as actual steel output. Apparently, as all these rural steel workers found out, the hard way, I might add, there was more to it than melting down steel and iron farming and cooking implements and remolding them into steel billets, rods, and cold-rolled steel. Nobody outside of the country's main steel producers knew what they were doing. Nonetheless, when Mao inspected these communes, all he saw were furnaces as far as the eye could see. Some of them set up purposely along his train route so he could see them even at night. These backyard furnaces sort of symbolize the futility of the Great Leap Forward. Whenever I think of the Great Leap, these backyard furnaces are sort of the icon of the whole campaign. The propaganda posters, too. Make more steel. Increase the speed of building socialism. They just consumed endless amounts of coal and just couldn't have been more inefficient. As I said, hardly anything was usable that was made. So Mao was completely under the illusion that all this collectivization had worked. By the fall of 1958, they had organized 750,000 of these agricultural cooperatives set up in the mid-50s into 26,578 people's communes of 5,000 households, or about 22,000 people each. And each commune was a sole accounting unit made up of a production team, or sheng chan dui, and a production brigade, or sheng chan da dui. <laughs> these were heady days. And although the peasants were dragged, kicking and screaming into these communes, nobody was dying yet in 1958. Then came 1959. China didn't get the favorable weather they enjoyed in 1958. 1959 was not a year of good weather for China's farmers. That made it convenient for the officials to point a finger at nature for any shortcomings in reaching production targets. But despite all that, reports were sent to the top that grain production had increased from 10,000 pounds per acre to 20,000 and even 30,000 pounds per acre. When 1959 rolled around, the reality was so many peasants had been sent to the urban areas to work on construction and infrastructure projects. There weren't enough strong backs left behind to deal with the bountiful 1958 harvest. There are plenty of stories about how crops just rotted in the fields for lack of farmers to harvest everything. And besides, so many agricultural implements had been melted down to make useless steel, along with pots, pans, woks, doorknobs, gates, shovels. Not only were there not enough farmers, there weren't even enough hoes, plows, and scythes. 
Even by December 1958, everyone with a halfway decent political vantage point saw the disaster that was coming. Besides all that, Mao, in his stubborn way, after the Sino-Soviet split in June 1959, was determined to pay back China's 1.973 billion yuan debt to the Soviets ahead of schedule. He'd show Khrushchev. A lot of this debt, in fact most of it, was paid back in grain. So rather than lose face in front of Khrushchev by not paying the loan back fast enough, he let the Chinese peasants starve and shipped grain to the Soviet Union that might have saved lives in the China countryside. But Mao saved face... So China's Nongmin, or peasantry, not only had to ship all their grain out to the cities to feed the higher-priority urban population, but they also had to export grain to pay back debts to the Soviet Union. The way in which massive amounts of agricultural resources were diverted to industry and the state policy of procuring grain from the peasants led to malnutrition on a national scale and decimated the labor productivity. It was a debacle of biblical proportions. 1959 began what were known as the three bad years. The circumstances of these three years were so horrible that they went by many names. They were known as the three years big famine, or San Nian Da Ji Huang. 1959 to 1961 were also known as the three years of natural disasters. There's a guy named Yang Chi Sheng who wrote a thousand plus page work called Tombstone. He traveled throughout China during the 90s to research the famine, and this work is considered quite authoritative. He concluded that as many as 36 million people died from starvation and other unnatural causes during this period. In 1960, drought or bad weather hit 55% of all cultivated land. 60% of the agricultural land in the north of China didn't see a drop of rain. Grain output in 1952 was 164 million tons and increased each year until 1958 when the figures reached about 200 million tons. In 1959, however, when the blowback started, grain production had fallen to 170 million tons and 143 million tons in the worst year, 1960. 1961 saw a slight increase to 148 million tons, and once Mao stepped aside and Liu Shaoqi, Zhou Enlai, and Deng Xiaoping were handed back control of the economy, things started to recover. By 1965, Agriculture had recovered to the point where it had been seven years prior in 1958, just before the famine started raging through the countryside. How many people died from the famine caused by the Great Leap Forward? Eh, estimates range from China's official estimate of 14 million to as high as 43 million. As I said, I tend to go with Yang Qisheng's number or thereabouts. So let's say it was around... 30 to 35 million people who perished. That's more than the entire population of the great state of Texas. So let's just back up a little and look at the Lushan Conference and the heroic Peng De Huai. As I said, end of 1958, things first started to unravel. Mao began to get reports that, in so many words, showed that his idea wasn't going too well. The winter of 1958 saw the first food shortages in Beijing. Marshal Peng De Huai had toured the country in the fall of 1958 and had seen firsthand the disaster that was coming. On June 25, 1959, Mao visited his birthplace of Shaoshan in deepest Hunan province. A coming home to his birthplace woke Mao up from his dream. It was after this Shaoshan experienced that he began giving out orders to start winding things down. The furnaces, the communal dining halls, building all these reservoirs. With the magnitude of the Great Leap's failure known to all, the following month, July 1959, the leadership met in the city of Lushan in Jiangxi province. Lushan had been the site of past historic meetings when Jiang Kai-shek was sitting in the chair that Mao now occupied. 
The purpose of this meeting was to have a discussion regarding the Great Leap Forward. By now, everyone at the table knew it was a mistake that was turning into a full-fledged social and economic disaster. So at Lushan, this was going to be the chance for everyone to get everything off their chest and find some way to get Mao to back down from his Great Leap Forward. In his opening address, Mao, of course, praised the Great Leap Forward and its success, but admitted there were some problems that were getting fixed. That set the tone right away. He didn't call it a mistake. It didn't say anything about giving it up. So those gathered together that day got the hint, and everyone knew better than to counter his optimism. But one person did. And though immortalized for many other things, I think Peng De Huai is best remembered for his private 10,000-character letter he passed to Chairman Mao on July 14, 1959. Now, who was Peng De Huai? Some of you might be asking. He was China's defense minister, and like Mao, he came from Hunan province, from a dirt, poor background. And in fact, Peng was the only one in the top rung of leadership who could claim this poor of a peasant class background, hailing from a small village southwest of Xiangtan in deepest Hunan. Everyone else at the top came from at least something, but not Peng. He came from nothing, which of course in those days was a good thing. He was a military man's military man and had been with Mao Zedong since the Jingangshan days in the 1930s. Peng had scored great victories for the communists during the Civil War, and lest we in America forget, it was Peng De Huai who led troops against the coalition forces in the Korean War. He was blunt, straightforward, and not too politically astute. It's almost certain he had some help from others in writing that private letter. He spoke from his heart and told Mao that there were mistakes made in launching this Great Leap Forward. The way Mao read it, the letter mainly said the Great Leap Forward was more bad than good and we should learn from the mistakes made. Two days later, Mao called a meeting of all the top leaders. And he said that rightists outside the party had criticized the Great Leap Forward. And now some within the party were criticizing by saying the Great Leap Forward did more harm than good. And Mao named names and passed Peng's private letter to everyone to study. Mao made it clear in so many words that either they were with him or with Peng. And if they were with Peng, Mao threatened to take to the hills and start a new army and a new party. He basically threw down the gauntlet at Lushan, and from that point forward, it was clear that any further criticism of the Great Leap Forward went hand-in-hand hand with criticizing Chairman Mao personally. And if you knew it was good for you, you knew who to stand behind in this struggle. On July 23rd, nine days after Peng delivered his secret letter to Mao, the chairman refuted the letter point by point at a Politburo session. Peng was present at the meeting, and Mao just turned on his old comrade-in-arms going back to the earliest days when they all ate out of a common rice pot, and everyone else, if they knew what was good for them, followed Mao's lead and piled on Peng De Huai. He ended up being branded a rightist, and his career and life, in fact, was finished. He ended up being abused, humiliated, and degraded during the Cultural Revolution, and this hero of the PRC, who people usually say, Ta Gan Shou Hua, he dared to speak up. Now, he died in disgrace in 1974. It's interesting to note the guy who succeeded Peng De Huai as defense minister was none other than Lin Biao. Lin, the hero of Manchuria during the Chinese Civil War, began politicizing the PLA as soon as he got comfortable in Peng's old office. He ran things differently from Peng De Huai, the way Mao liked things to be run. But that's all another podcast for another day. Again, you could listen to the eight-part Cultural Revolution series to hear more about that. So the Lushan Conference ended, and it was a complete victory for Mao and a bitter defeat for Peng De Huai and a few others who dared to speak up. Party leadership had, up till then, been a united front, but now the bane of politics, factionalism, began to take shape. The document produced from the Lushan Conference 
praised the Great Leap Forward, and it was approved. And after Lushan, even with all these reports of malnutrition on a national scale, Mao went all out to promote his Great Leap Forward policies. 1960 was another terrible year for China's agricultural sector. Back in 1958, the party had launched the Four Pests campaign to eradicate rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. So good a job did the Chinese Lao Bai Xing do in eradicating sparrows. Farmers in 1960 faced a locust infestation to end all locust infestations. All the sparrows had been killed in the Four Pests campaign, so nature did what nature did with no sparrows to eat those locusts, a large share of the grain harvest ended up being consumed by locusts instead of people. Mother Nature, always ready to teach humankind a lesson. Economic and food aid was offered by other nations, but refused. That would have been too much of a loss of face for Mao and the party to accept handouts at a time like this. By 1961, the Great Leap Forward policies were reversed, and Mao sort of laid low until he began his comeback later in 1965-66. There was so much that needed emergency relief. But one good thing, there were a cast of capable people at the top who were able to right this massive ship of state. But despite all that, as many as 36 million people died. Mao never lived to see China overtake all the industrialized economies in the world. By messing with the established order in the countryside... Mao's Great Leap Forward policies, coupled with some bad luck with the weather, caused the worst famine ever seen on this earth since recorded history. It would take the first half of the 1960s to clean up the wreckage of this man-made catastrophe and return agricultural yields to where it had been in 1957 before Mao began the Great Leap. You have to remember, this was late 50s, early 60s, and if you were alive back then, you recall that China was closed as tightly as what we can see in North Korea today. No one knew what was really going on there, certainly not uh, American intelligence agencies. In fact, it really wasn't until 20 years after the end of the Great Leap Forward that the truth began to emerge about the true extent of the devastation of the countryside. And not all these deaths came from starvation. They were millions of deaths due to other collateral reasons that all had one thing or another to do with every man looking out for himself. 1959 and 1961 were hard years in China, and a lot harder for some than others, particularly the deeper into the countryside you went. These peasants working the fields on an empty stomach were unsung heroes, and a case of people who died so that others might live. After China began its opening to the outside world around 1979, records were studied for the first time, and demographers have been able to study data and come up with their own estimates of how many perished. The Great Leap Forward and the immediate aftermath sowed the seeds of what would, in 1966, be known as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Again, if you care to follow up on that, I encourage you to go listen to the CHP eight-part series on the Cultural Revolution, episodes 83 to 90. So that's going to be it for this simple overview about the Great Leap Forward, the Da Yue Jin. If you're looking to take a deeper dive than what I've offered, there are plenty of books and internet resources that can explain in more detail the Great Leap as well as the consequences. You don't have to look too hard. For now, this is Laszlo Montgomery of Teacup Media signing off from Los Angeles, California, welcoming you to listen to our other programs. Yeah, there's a couple others besides this one, the Chinese Sayings Podcast and the China Vintage Hour. If you can't get enough China in your life, all available online at teacup.media and soon on 8-track and cassette. And also, don't forget, Chinese Sayings Podcast and the China History Podcast you could hear it on Cathay Pacific Airways and their in-flight entertainment system. That'll help that 15-hour flight go by pleasurably. Thanks for listening, everyone, and please come back again for more. Over 100 hours of Chinese history is here for you, all free, all the time. Take care, everyone.